criticism. Telephone girls. Girls have always been joined with telephone systems. Not just teenage gossips or 1940s girls, scalp smelling of chemical burns for days after each perm and wear fat lipstick. Girls plugged into circuit boards, primed for scandal, heavy Bakelite ear cones and mouthpieces rising like snake heads up from their breasts. But that's not what I mean. I mean anchorites, telephones to God. They chose to be built into church walls. Dame Julian of Norwich, Emma of All Saints North Street, York, the masonry rising like slow upward guillotines. The simple engineers would leave a slot to admit a parcel of light and air, food and requested prayers. But they believed that in this pure removal they'd become a prayer machine that would bypass the pleading din, that each day of their silence would be a stitch, sewing their lips and ears into the robe of God until his tears would fall directly in his lap. I was interested reading uh, in newspapers recently about how car sales are finally going down. They've been growing every year since the 1930s, Great Depression. But in the last two years, they've faltered and started to fall. And I was thinking about how it changes how we feel about where we live, that the way that we travel and the way we consume a landscape has changed, and how imposing that can feel. England. England of the burrowing green, the chalk galvanized giant, the undulating earthbank fortress, the flinted Roman wall, the full flared gorse, the messy hay trails waiting to be bin bag bailed by machines mandibles. Where did you go? You unroll through the window of a train, but should I get out in search of you, you'd be off, and I'd be left wandering down dual carriageways, looking across private fields and roadside ditches. The city absorbs us and we grow stiff. The sky, a small trap door above our heads. Last night I saw your picture, a pillow of green on a living room wall. England, we meet for visits a few times a year, but you seem absent-minded. It's such an effort. I do all the planning and we don't talk. It's like taking someone I used to know to lunch. And last up, I was thinking of people being trapped, and I was thinking of Atlas. Not Atlas how he is in the myth holding up the sky, because then he's obviously trapped. If he dropped the sky, he's going to get squished. But Atlas as he is on architecture and statuary, where he's holding the world up. And he's obviously trapped because he's holding the world, but why doesn't he just walk away? Why can't he let go? Atlas. Pushed into the putty of his face. His arms are bent and both palms up to keep it on the column of his spine. A ball inflated with churning iron that tears its skin like rising dough and ruptures in small spots, copping up boiling rock and blinding ash through tiny puckered lips. He remembers, but he doesn't know who told him or if it was in a dream that the surface is lousy with microscopic beasts, some of which have souls, like pale balloons tied to their wrists. If he could squint his eyes tight enough, he could see if this were true, if it was worth the effort, or if he can let it drop to burst at his feet. He fantasizes, a torturer, forcing him to hold the churning stone. A man with the thinnest of steel knives resting on his sternum, ready to push through the flesh and run it down to his groin, his guts slithering out, if he dare let go.